Okay. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Nat here. So we are continuing with module number 11. So module 11 is quite lengthy, just like module number 10. We are still talking about hypothesis. This is the whole module is about hypothesis testing. So this is a, like a general recap of hypothesis testing on what we have covered uh, last class, which is the steps in performing hypothesis testing, which is first you need to know what is your null hypothesis and also what is your alternative hypothesis. But before you can identify what is your null hypothesis and also your alternate hypothesis, you need to know what your, what your data, your, um, how do I say this? You have your data, what parameter are you observing or what parameter are you interested in? Let's say you have a problem the problem has certain parameters. Which parameter are you looking at to form your hypothesis? You have to pick one. Uh, let's say you're talking about the first year students of CCSE and the first year students of CCSE has a lot of variables, has a lot of data associated with them. For example, um, one of the questions that I got from you guys was, uh, does the student, does the first year student have driving driver's license? Um, does the CCSE student have uh, more than three siblings, for example? Um, what else? Uh, uh, are they from, did they receive uh, their foundation in UPM or did they receive their foundation program from matriculation, for example? <clears throat> so a lot of uh, parameters are associated with you guys and it is important for you to know what parameter that you are interested in and when you know what you want to look at you have to specify even further are you looking at the mean or are you looking at the proportion or the probability of something happening and it doesn't have to be that general the problem doesn't have to be that general you can be very very specific for example uh, the battery lifetime of the first year students of CCSE. In that case, you can talk about the mean lifetime of the battery, of the battery of the phone, or you can talk about the mean battery of the laptop. How long does it last? Eight hours? What's your hypothesis for this? The mean lifetime of the laptop battery is uh, less than or equal to five. That is your null hypothesis. For example, so those are the things that you can uh, look into. Again, you can edit your form. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, eventually, if you do not like what you came up with, with the data that you want to collect, you can always let me know and we can adjust things, okay? All right, so first identify the parameter of interest and describe it in the context of the problem situation. Define the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Assume, always assume that the null hypothesis is true. So you have to really think, uh, what do you want to assume as true? And when you, because when you reject this null hypothesis, it is a strong conclusion. Uh, it indicates that, you, um, that the null hypothesis is rejected and when you, are, when you are rejecting the null hypothesis, it, it is a very strong conclusion. And it means that you are very, very convinced that this is what is happening. So you have to re be really, you have to really think this through is what I'm trying to say here. Okay, the third one is compute a test statistic. Uh, this is easy, the Z-score. I believe the tricky part is this guy over here and defining your problem that you, wanted to, you want to look at. The Z-score is just easy. And then compute the p-value of the test statistic, the p-value is the probability assuming the null hypothesis to be true. And then uh, our null hypothesis will have a null distribution. And typically we assume that our null distribution follows a normal distribution. It's just a name. The null distribution is just the name for H0. State a conclusion about the strength of the evidence against H0. And we've seen this, if the p-value is less than 5%, then we would say that uh, we are, the smaller the P, we are rejecting H0. This is what we said earlier. But we will see that 5% is not only the level that we can look at. We can have several levels, and we'll talk more on that later on. And then the formulation of hypothesis should be done before examining the data. Meaning to say, you cannot look at the data and analyze it and then form your null hypothesis. The null hypothesis and the 
alternative hypothesis should come before you analyze the data. You can't, you, I have the data. I'm not giving it yet to you until you give me the null and also the alternate hypothesis. If your null hypothesis is wrong, then it's okay. This is what we're trying to prove, whether we re are rejecting or are, we are accepting or supporting that the null hypothesis is correct. Okay, so it doesn't have to be correct. It just has to be in context, I would say. Okay, so we have covered this one, I think. So again, this is the z-score, which is the test statistic. Find, find the p-value. Here we saw that it was three, 0 0.0036, very, very low. Therefore, we reject H0. So a very small p uh, tells us that we should reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative. Have I gone through this one? We have. Okay, and then we also talked about this one. The null hypothesis always has an equality. So if you're confused which one should be the null hypothesis, look at the statement that has equality. What does equality mean? It means that it has the equal sign. So if for this case, equality means this one, right? But this is also equality and this is also equality. So the one that does not have that is your alternative hypothesis, okay? So that's like the general rule. And then, so there's another rule uh, to forming your hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis usually represents the question to be answered. Yeah, let's go for an example. We already did this one and this one as well. Okay, we have not gone through example number three. Okay, let's go for this one. A scale is to be calibrated by weighing a 1000 gram test weight 60 times. So you have a scale. Okay, maybe this is not the weighing scale that we typically see. Maybe it's like this, I don't know. Maybe, we don't know. We, we have several scales type, right? So a scale is to be to be calibrated by, a, by weighing a 1000 gram test weight. So if we were talking about this type of scale, I'm gonna put like a block which is 1,000 gram true weight, and this guy, 1,000 gram. Doesn't really matter which scale we're using. And then we are doing this for 60 times. So I'm doing this 60 times, very, very tiring, but it is necessary to collect our data. The 60 scale readings have a mean of 1,000.6 grams. This guy, the 1,000 gram is the true weight. So if you're getting something that is not 1,000, you know that your scale uh, is off, right? Your scale is off. This is why we need to calibrate it and has a standard deviation of two grams. Again, if we have a standard deviation, we know that this value is not absolute. Um, we cannot conclude based on this sample. Find the p-value for testing the null hypothesis where the mean population is equal to 1,000 versus the alternate hypothesis is not equal to 1,000. So the one, what we're looking at is we want to say that this scale is indeed um, performing well. We're saying that this scale is performing well. Therefore, the null hypothesis tells us that the mean is 1,000, which is the true weight of the block. But our sample mean gives us a reading of 1,000.6 gram with a standard deviation of two. So the null hypothesis says that the scale is in calibration. The alternate hypothesis says that the scale is out of calibration. So it has to be opposite. The null hypothesis specifies that the mu is equal to a specific value rather than greater or equal or less than or equal to, meaning to say you have that equality thing. So here you have that equality equals to 1,000, so you know that this is the null hypothesis right off the bat. For this reason, the values values of sample mean that are much that are either much larger or much smaller than mu will provide evidence, again, 
null hypothesis. So this is what we're looking at. Okay, so this is the solution. We assume that the null hypothesis is true. This is the step that we have to go through. We have defined the null hypothesis. We have defined the H1, the alternate hypothesis. We assume that the null hypothesis is true and we try to prove it. It is true until it is proven otherwise. It is innocent until proven guilty. So the null distribution of our sample mean is normal distribution with a mean of 1000 and a standard deviation of this guy because our uh, S is two. Therefore, this is going to be our, um, our normal distribution standard deviation. So the Z-score of the observed value sample mean 1000.6 is, so we use our Z-score. This is the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard deviation of your normal distribution. Since our null hypothesis specifies that the mu is 1000, meaning to say this region, we know that we're looking at this side and this side. The null hypothesis, let me repeat myself here. The null hypothesis tells that it is equal to 1000. It is equal to 1000, this region. So if we're looking at this region, when we are finding the z-score, it would correspond to two p-values over here. Okay, so this is like a two-sided confidence interval that we have seen before, but it's not really confidence interval. This is hypothesis testing or p-value. So again, uh, if we have this, we are looking in two sides. If we're talking about this one or this one, we're looking at one side uh, of the p-value. I'm, I'm gonna uh, summarize on this in a bit, but let's look at this one first. So regions in both tails of the curve are in greater disagreement than the observed value of 1000.6. So let's look at this diagram. Our z-score is 2.32, which gives us 0. Point. Here you see that we have the z 2.32. Look, look, look in your CDF table. So you would get 0. 0.0102 or 1 minus the CDF of z 2.32. You would get this value. And then minus 2.32 would give you 0. 0.0102. So this is the probability of the probability that the sample mean takes on a value as extreme as or more extreme than the observed value of uh, 1000.6 is 0 .0, 0 0.0204. Therefore, we would reject this um, null hypothesis because it is very unlikely to happen. The probability is super small. Therefore, our null hypothesis is rejected. Okay, what does this tell us actually? Yeah, we have the p-value. It tells us we should reject the null hypothesis, what, but what does it mean? Um, it, when we're looking at the p-value, we get the z-score from the sample mean minus the mu divided by the standard deviation. And these two guys are from this distribution, right? We're trying to look if this sample mean comes from this guy over here. We're trying to look at the sample mean if it comes from here. And we found out that the sample mean, if it comes from this distribution, the probability of that happening is just these two from this sample, from this distribution, meaning to say that it is very, very unlikely. So let's say we have we identify a different distribution whereby it is not 1000. Let's say it is uh, 1050. And my z-score gives me a higher probability of this happening, which means that this is like slightly bigger than what we're looking at here. Then it would say that, oh, uh, we are accepting the null hypothesis that the mu is 1050. What does this tell us? It tells us that the sample mean comes from a distribution where the mean population is 1050 and the standard deviation is two over whatever the value that they specify. So they are trying to say that the sample mean comes from here or does it not come from here? This is what we're talking about. I hope that makes sense. Let's look at a different example. 
Okay. So example number four. If you have any questions, you can interrupt me, okay? So a manufacturer of a certain brand of rice cereal claims that the average saturated fat content does not exceed 15 milligrams. So I'm just going to try to form my null hypothesis here. Does not exceed. So we would have two situations. Uh, does not exceed 15 milligram. Does not exceed. So 15 milligram is uh, the is whatever this is, it is less than 15 milligrams. What should this be? Sorry, this should be mu. Average, right? Mu. So is this my null hypothesis or is this my alternative hypothesis? Pretty easy. What's the answer, guys? <clears throat> Alternative. Alternative, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so mu less than 15 milligrams. We're not going to put the units here. Uh, is going to be our alternate alternate hypothesis or alternative and uh, the mu that is greater than or equal to 15 is going to be our null. Does not exceed 15. I hope this is what it means. Okay. Mm. Uh, state the null and alternative hypothesis to be used in testing this claim and determine where the critical region is located. So previously, I talked about um, using a number that is closest to H1, but it is still within H0 or the null hypothesis. I don't, I don't know if you guys still remember that. So that value is called critical value. Let me just refresh you on that one. Critical value is a value within H0, H0 range, but is the closest to H1. Okay, so here we can already know lah. this is like given. It's 15, right? It's because 15 is equal or within the range of H0, but it is the closest one to H1. So obviously the critical value here is 15. So with the critical value comes the critical region. So now they're asking us determine where the critical region is located. Okay, so let's look at that. So here the manufacturer's claim should be rejected. It does not exceed. So they're saying does not exceed is equal to 15. Doctor, you can better exit mean can equal right? Yeah. That, that's what I was confused about. Does not exit can be equal to 15. Let me try to look the definition. Because <laughs> this is English, right? So does not exit meaning. Should not exceed. I, I'm not convinced about this answer, but we'll go with it. Um, what if this happens in the exam? Uh, does not exceed. Because by definition, it's not supposed to surpass the value. Okay, so I'm going to take note on this and not to have it, to have this word in the exam. Does not exceed. So we're going to go with the solution because I want to discuss the solution. So we're going to say does not exceed includes the 15. Does not exceed. 
for now does not exceed uh, includes the limit. It's just syntax, by the way. Does not exceed includes the limit, which is 15. So here I need to reformulate my H0. So if the H0 includes 15, does not exceed. So this becomes our null hypothesis. Okay. Not very happy about this, but it's okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's assume that does not exceed includes the limit as well, which includes 15. So that becomes our null hypothesis and also the alternative hypothesis. So the non-rejection of H0, when we are, okay, we have to talk about two um, scenarios. The first one being, what happens if we reject H0? This is always going to be the question that you have to answer. What happens if we reject H0? And number two, what happens if we do not uh, reject H0? What does it mean? What does it imply for our data? What happens if we do not reject? So this is something that you should look into your reporting as well for your group project. Okay, so what happens if we reject H0? What would, what do, would this imply? So look at this. If we reject H0, we say that it is not plausible. So meaning to say that we are accepting this one, right? So we are saying that the average saturated fat content exceeds 15 milligram. With full conviction, we are saying that it is um, greater than 15. So the if we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, if we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, we are saying that the average saturated fat content is less than or equal to 15, but at the same time, we're not rejecting H1. So it could, it could also mean that the average saturated fat content is also greater. Does that make sense? So if we are rejecting this, we can only accept this one, right? If we are rejecting, but if we do not reject H, the null hypothesis, this guy is still plausible. A little bit confusing. Okay. So here, um, why this example is relevant? Because it tells us about the one-tailed hypothesis test. Previously, we were talking about uh, mu being equal to 1,000, and then we were looking at these two regions, right? But when we're talking about the less than or greater than we're talking about a one-tailed hypothesis test. And what does that look like? Does it give it up? I have to draw it myself. So for the one, for this one, we have our z-score. And our z-score would be the sample mean minus the mu that we specify, which is the critical value, 15 divided by the standard deviation of the normal distribution that we assume that our that data is from. And from this z-score, let's say we get some value of z alpha. Um, that z alpha has to be over here or over here, right? It cannot be on both sides because we're talking about uh, whether it's greater or less than. So which side should it go is the question. So we always look back to our H1. We always look back to our H1 and we follow this. We follow this uh, sign. So they are saying that the mu is greater than 15. It's greater than 15, greater than 15. So we are looking at, I believe this one. Let me see this one. If we're looking at, I have this over here. If we're looking at something that is greater, area to the right of Z. Oh, my bad, sorry. Area to the right of Z. We're not looking at here. So we're looking at this region over here. This is our Z alpha. Okay, so let's look at the cheat sheet, so to say. So here we have our upper tail test. So 
HA alternative contains the inequality, which is greater than. So this is the region that we're looking at. Depending on what Z that you're looking at, the Z is here or the Z is here. So this would be over here. So it depends on where your Z is at. And then when we're looking at lower tail test, which means that your H alternative, should write H1 over here, is has this symbol, has this sign, then you're looking at um, the p-value in the area of the lower tail. And when we're talking about the two tail test where your H1 is not equal to something that we saw just now, which is 1000, you're looking at these two regions. Okay, so basically, you just follow the sign of H1. Just follow the sign of H1. So greater, we are going to say positive side and less than, we're going to say negative side of the normal distribution. If that formula helps you. I should use it because I can't remember it. Okay, so summary of the one tilt versus two tilt test. So this is something for you to think about as well. Are you going to make a, a hypothesis that is a two tilt test or a one tilt test? Which hypothesis would you go for? So let x1 up to xn be a large sample, more than 30, from a population with mean of mu and standard deviation. To test a null hypothesis of the form, this form, um, where you ha always have this equality sign, Compute the z-score, compute the z-score, and if your standard deviation is unknown, it may be approximated with a sample standard deviation. Compute the p-value, the p-value is the area under the normal curve, which depends on the alternate hypothesis as follows. And again, the sign tells you which area you should look at, which tells you your p-value. So the p-value is always at the ends, but which end, right? Which n? So this one, uh, you just follow this guy. Lah. I I'm not going to draw it. So area to the right of z over here. This one is area to the left of z over here. And this is two-tailed test. So our assumption for our hypothesis testing, if we're following this one, the assumption is to is that the data it follows a normal population distribution with a known value of a standard deviation. This is the assumption that we have. Again, why is it a normal population? Because our sample size is greater than 30 and it follows the central limit theorem. And again, your central limit theorem is everywhere. You have to understand it. Any questions about this one? No? Okay, really sorry about the does not exceed thing. I am going to take note of that and not to put it in the exam. Confusing. Okay, so how do we reject our null hypothesis? Previously, we were talking about the one tilt test and two tilt test. Uh, and which area of the p-value should we look at? Because the p-value is important for us to reject the h naught, right? But there are, of course, there are further things that we need to know before we can totally reject our null hypothesis. The only two conclusions that can be reached in a hypothesis test are that the null hypothesis is false or that the null hypothesis is plausible. Uh, the smaller the p-value, the more certain we can be that the null hypothesis is false. So p-value, small, reject. Large p-value, possible to uh, the null hypothesis is plausible. What does plausible mean? It means that the values are possible. It can happen. It can happen, which means that we can never be sure but the possibility of that happening is there. I know this is what statistic, statistics is. A rule of thumb suggests that to reject null hypothesis whenever P is less than or equal to 0 0.05. While this rule is convenient, it has no scientific basis, like I mentioned to you before. So because of this, because of this, sorry, distracted, because of this, um, we can actually define our significant, we can actually define the threshold. Uh, for example, we can define our threshold to be 1%, 5%, 3%, 10%. 10%. Um, typically, they go as far as 10 and as low as 1. So we'll talk more on that. So this is called statistical significance, defining the threshold. 
Whenever the p-value is less than a particular threshold, the result is that is said to be statistically significant at that level. For example, we were talking about if p is less than or equal to 0 0.05, therefore we would say that this data has a value of p of something and it is statistically significant at 5%. It is statistically significant at 5% if this is the threshold that we are specifying. It depends on you. So let's say you have your p-value. This is like a random example. Let's say your p-value, whoops. Let's say your p-value is quite, uh, quite small, 0 0.001. What does this give us? It's 0.1%, right? So you would say that, okay, my, our p-value is 0 0.01 and it is statistically significant at 5%. Because why? Because you specified you want it to be significant at 5%. But in reality, I can also say it like this. The p-value is 0 0.01 and it is statistically significant at 1%. Because why? It is still less than or equal to 1%. It is still less than. So, but when you are talking about, when you don't report the p-value, let's say you say that, okay, so the data uh, is statistically significant at 5%, but you don't tell me what your p-value is, meaning to say you calculate what, whatever the value is, but you don't tell me, you just say, oh, it is statistically significant at 5%. I wouldn't know if your p-value is like super small or it's like at the edge of 5%. Uh, your p-value can be 4.99, your p-value can also be 0 0.0001, right? I wouldn't know because there's a range. So it is better for you to report your p-value as well as its statistical significance. Now, it seems like the statistical significance is redundant, right? Because we can just say the p-value, but we have, to, we have to report it as well, okay? So for example, if P is, oh, sorry, I already mentioned this one. Summary, let alpha be any value between zero and one. Then if P is less than or equal to alpha, alpha can be any value from zero to one. The result of the test is said to be statistically significant at 100 times alpha percent. So we specified earlier that our alpha is 0 0.05. So if I were to multiply, with 0 0.05, I would get 5%. So this is what 100 alpha percent means. So null hypothesis is rejected at 100 alpha percent level. And if you specify that the 5% is your alpha, you reject if your p-value is, you reject the null hypothesis if your p-value is less than 5%. Let's say you define your, um, uh, you define your alpha to be 1%. If your p-value is 1.2%, your alpha is 1%. So you do not reject your null hypothesis. This is why uh, it is very important for you to mention your threshold or mention your alpha because it, uh, it determines whether you reject your null hypothesis or not. So when reporting the result of a hypothesis test, report the p-value rather than just comparing it to 5% or 1%. So you need to have two, 1%, 5%, or whatever your p-value number is, not or, n. You have to have both. Okay, so again, I'm going to recap this. Your p-value tells you how, uh, how likely your null hypothesis is true or false, right? This is what it tells you. Your statistical significance tells you the threshold of which you are going to reject your null hypothesis or accept. So 5%, 10%, 1% depends on you. But you have to define that early on. So the p-value is the smallest level of significance that would lead to rejection of the null hypothesis with the given data, whatever that means. Okay, so what time is it? It's 10. I'm going to take a five minute break. I'm going to let uh, you guys have your break. And if you have any questions regarding your null hypothesis, you can ask me right now. Let's come back at 1020, if that's okay with everyone.
time yet, not yet. Excuse me. So I'm looking at the form. Uh, only nine groups has has submitted. So I hope the other three uh, can submit soon. So group one, group two is missing. Group six is missing. Two and six. Group two, six, and twelve. Okay, I'm gonna look at the Excel. Uh, it's already 1021. Let me just look at what we have. So group number two, six, and 12, please submit um, your question. The question is the most important one. Your hypothesis, you can um, change that later because your question is for your data collection. So you can't have that too late. Uh, I was going to look at the Excel. Okay, let me do that. I have like 1,000 messages coming in. Okay, exaggeration, but too many. Can't keep up. Form, stats, form, share. So we're not yet actually collecting data yet. So I guess I can share. Let's see. Google Chrome. Share. Sign in. Can you guys see my screen? Yes or no? I'm looking at the form. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is not the interesting part. Oh, I have 10 responses now. Cool. So two more. Again, don't be scared to submit your hypothesis because you can change it later. I'm ju I just want you, I just want to see what you have. Okay, so this is what I have from you guys. Let me hide this uh, and hide this as well. Hide column times stamp. The one that just submitted is group two. I'm waiting for group 12 and six. Please do so soon. Hide column, okay. So this is the question that we're looking at. Let's not look at the hypothesis yet. So the first one, how many hours do you spend on social media per day? So we're talking about average here, right? So this is a good question, actually. Uh, TikTok, Insta, FB in general. So let's say you spend uh, seven hours, six hours, eight hours. So from the data, they can get the mean, the population mean, right? But they have to form their hypothesis first. 
and the hypothesis that they have here that year one CCSE students have mean have an average time of using social media more than or equal more than or equal to four hours per day. So let's say they reject this hypothesis. What would this study mean? What would this test mean? It means that the CCSE students spend more time doing work instead of social media. So this is a good hypothesis actually. Okay, good job number four. Um, how many times does uh, does eat in a day an average weight? So they are tackling two birds with one stone here. So it's okay if you want to collect, um, if your question is more elaborate and the data that you collect is totally up to you to analyze. Uh, you can be more specific, you can be general, doesn't really matter, as long as you know what you're doing. So how many times do you eat in a day? And what is your average weight? And again, don't worry, uh, your data will be anonymous. So the null hypothesis is, so they have not specified what their hypothesis is, but they want to go for proportion. Do you understand what the form says? I said that you can either talk about the average mean or you can talk about the proportion, but you still have to have the null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. Uh -huh. Please fix this uh, after this. Uh, ho hopefully, um, this today's lecture will help you understand better what that proportion means. Okay, so next one is, so how would I form a null hypothesis for this one? Um, the average number of the average number of times that they eat or the average weight can go for that. Okay, number three, can vitamins, sorry, num group number seven, can vitamin C take care of our acne? So the null hypothesis is uh, the people who take vitamin C are more likely to have acne. <clears throat> and the alternative hypothesis is people who take vitamin C are less likely to have acne. So um, it is okay for your hypothesis is okay, but <clears throat> we are talking about proportion here. So the probability uh, of those who take vitamin C, you have to specify what probability, um, if they take vitamin C, do they have acne? Do you understand what I'm saying? So here, this question is not, a good question to ask your classmates because it is asking for their opinion. And this is not, opinions are not data. Okay, opinions is not data. So you, what, you can, um, what you can change is, do you take vitamin C? Yes or no? If you take vitamin C, do you have acne? So that in that way, you can know the probability of people who don't have acne and also consume vitamin C. So this is another way. Uh, this is, you have to rephrase this question. It's not correct. Okay, so group number seven, please discuss again this one. Uh, group number five, if you can only watch one type of movie for the rest of your life, do you choose Disney or Marvel? So this one, we are talking about proportions. Uh, the proportion of students that choose Marvel over Disney is 66%. So they are talking about uh, equal, right? Equal to 66%. This, this is the null hypothesis. Uh, okay, I think this is okay, acceptable. Good job. Uh, number eight, the rate of students. So number seven, please, um, ref please discuss again. You can use this subject, but you have to rephrase it. Okay, so number eight, the rate of students spending on for a given day, or they also translated this in uh, Bahasa, kadar perbelanjaan student pada, sesu pada suatu hari tertentu. For a given day. Mm, okay, I guess okay. Uh, so we're talking about the mean here. Again, you have to specify what your null and your alternative hypothesis. Again, you can make mistakes here. It's okay. We can discuss. So please specify what it is. If you don't specify, you're going to wait until the last minute and you're going to screw up. So I don't want you to do that. Okay, so number 10. This one is okay. You can talk about the average uh, student spending in one day. Uh, legit question. 
so but you the way that you would rephrase this question to ask your friends is how much money do you spend in a day on average so this is a way to rephrase that so you can collect um you can collect data better uh, because you need to make your audience understand what you want, right? So if you ask them, what is the rate of student spending? They wouldn't know. They're, they are just a person. They wouldn't know the rate of all the students spending. What you ask your students, I'm sorry, what you ask your classmate is, how much do you spend in a day? And from that data, what is the rate of student spending, right? So it is supposed to be questions over here not statements. Okay, number 10. Uh, how much do you guys spend in a day? So number 10 and number 8 is similar. Let me see the timestamp. Whoever submitted earlier will keep the question. Uh, oh, I forgot how to open the height. Unhide columns. So group 10 submitted. <laughs> they submitted around the same time. But Group number eight gets to keep it. So group number 10, please change your uh, question, okay? I'm just trying to be fair here. Sorry, okay, hide column. Uh, how many hours did you spend? Oh no, again, similar question. And hide, uh, so number four submitted last night. And number, this one submitted this morning. So you have to change. Okay, so that's first year CSE student have driving license. Um, yes. So how you can rephrase this is, do you have a student driving license? Sorry, do you have a driver's license, right? Uh, the null hypothesis here is that they're saying that the proportion of students that have driver's license is 20. And the null is 20 or equal, okay? So far, okay, I think. But when we're talking about proportions, remember, we're talking about probability. It should be from 0 to 1. So 20 out of 59, right? So uh, change that to probability. Change that to proportion. Okay, so number one, please change your null. For those, I need to specify this one as well. Uh, by the way, you can't access this Excel sheet. I am the only one who has access. So just change in the form, okay? And this one, you have to change it as well. Um, this one, change overall. Responder updated the value. Oh, okay, let me see uh, later on. So how long did you sleep per day in a week? How long did you sleep per day in a week? I would just say, okay, you, maybe you want to collect data for uh, Sunday to Monday, I'm assuming. So you want them to specify the number of hours uh, on Monday, number of hours on Tuesday. So you can do that as well, but they would have to keep track of their sleeping cycle for the week. Hmm. You can do that, but it will take some time to collect the data. It will be possible if we start it now, but you would get your data by next Tuesday, right? If that's okay with you, we can proceed with that. And then for group number two, how many hours is your screen time in a day? You have to change this because it is the same. Um, unless you're talking about screen time, uh, that is not social media, screen time, social media plus working on laptop. So is that what you are asking or do you want to change this? Yes, doctor. So that's what you're asking. Okay, so you can have that. Sorry, no highlight. Number six, how many time, how many hours do you spend with gadget every day? Mm. I would say this is uh, equivalent to screen time actually because your laptop is also a gadget. So number six, please revise your question. Okay, so this is what we have so far. Everyone has submitted their question. Seven, ten, nine, six, please revise. Let's, hopefully by tomorrow, I can have 
the revised version. For those who I have discussed and I said, okay, and if you still want to revise, you can <clears throat> by before class tomorrow, okay? And then we'll discuss again. Is that okay with everyone? Yes or no? By tomorrow, class, before class tomorrow. Okay, so I see. Okay, Dr. Editing. All right, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and continue now. So hopefully that was helpful uh, for everyone. Uh, now I need to share my <clears throat> PowerPoint. Okay, so we're talking about statistical significance and I told you that alpha is uh, the threshold of which you reject or accept your null hypothesis. If it is 5%, then the, if the p-value is below 5%, then that would mean that you have to reject the null hypothesis. Let's say you have a, a threshold of your alpha is 10%, your p-value is 5%, then you wouldn't reject the null hypothesis. So this is what the alpha means. So... The question that we were talking about just now, or I have not talked about yet, a hypothesis test is performed of the null hypothesis of this mu. Uh, mu is equal to zero. I don't know if this is correct. I don't remember. Okay, but the p-value turns out to be 0 0.03. So the z-test score, um, that we calculated, which was the sample mean minus the mu divided by the standard deviation of the population distribution, uh, tells us that the p-value is 0 0.03. Sorry, the z-score is something. And from the z-score, our p-value is something. Is the result statistically, statistically significant at 10% level? The 5% level, the 1% level, is the null hypothesis rejected at the 10% level, the 5%, the 1%. So the result is statistically significant at any level greater than or equal to 3%. Where did the 3% come from? From here. So 0 0.03 times with 100%. This is your alpha. Sorry, this is not your alpha. This is your p-value. And this would give you a 3% p-value. So anything that is greater than or equal to 3% can be the statistical, can be your statistical significant value. Uh, for example, it is statistically significant at 10% because 10% is greater than 3. It is statistically significant at 5% because 5% is greater than 3. But it is not statistically significant at 1% level because 3% is greater than 1, right? So let's say we are rejecting null hypothesis at any level greater than or equal to 3%. So the null hypothesis is rejected at the 10 and 5% level, but not at 1%. Why? Because again, if our p-value is small, remember we are rejecting H0. How small is small? It is defined by our alpha. So here, if our alpha is 10%, and our p-value is 3, that is like super small compared to 10, right? So we reject uh, the, the null hypothesis. And again, if we choose our alpha to be 5%, the p-value is less than 5%, which means that it is small, we reject the null hypothesis. But if we say that our alpha is 1%, but our p-value is 3%, we need to say that the probability is high of the null hypothesis occurring at 1% level, so we do not reject. So this depends on you, actually. <clears throat> so when reporting the statistical significance, um, you should include the p-value. Very, very important. As I mentioned to you before, it tells you how far or how close the p-value is with your statistical significance. We were talking about 3% being the p-value, and you were talking about uh, the 10% statistical significance, 5% statistical significance. So 3% with 10 is like super far. It is more closer to 5. But we wouldn't know that if we did not give out the p-value. If we just reported the statistical significance, we wouldn't know this. So it is important for us to specify both. 
Okay, so this, these are the reasons of why we need to have the statistical significance together with the p-value. Uh, it can you can read this on your own. It's basically what I have summarized just now. Uh, this one, a report like this does not allow readers to decide for themselves whether the p-value is small enough to reject the null hypothesis. Mm, yeah, so these are the reasons. You can include this in your discussion as well for your report. In your own words, do not copy paste mine. Okay, so now we want to know how to choose a correct null hypothesis to answer the right question. So just now you specified your null hypothesis. It can be correct. It can be, uh, most of the time the null hypothesis is correct, but is it uh, good enough to answer the right question is um, the main idea that we want to go for. So suppose that a soft drink beverage bottler, <clears throat> so this guy, he packages a soft drink in, into bottles, right? So he purchases the bottles before he puts in the, Soft drink, of course. So he purchases 300 ml bottles uh, from a glass company. So yeah, so the bottler wants to be sure that the bottles meet the specification on the mean internal pressure or the bursting strength. So because soft drinks, they have like this gas, right? So the bottle that they use must be able to withstand that pressure of the gas. So it has the specification that he wants is that it has to have a strength of 200 PSI. So this is just a unit. You don't have to be concerned about this one. The bottler has decided to formulate the decision procedure for a specific lot of bottles as a hypothesis testing problem. So he wants to form a hypothesis on this problem. What is the problem? The problem context is about whether the bottle uh, can withstand 200 PSI or not. So there are two possible formulations for this problem. So the null hypothesis is mu equals to 200 PSI. Yes. And the alternative hypothesis is greater than 200 PSI, meaning to say that the bottle is stronger, uh, is able to withstand more pressure than what is specified. So this is our formulation number one. The second one is the mu is 200, but the bottle is weak. Uh, it cannot withstand the pressure that is specified. It doesn't follow the specs. Both of them, if we are, we are choosing H1, they are not following the specs. But when we are not following the specs using formulation one, we can still use the bottles, right? But if we are choosing formulation two, if I go for the alternative hypothesis or if I reject the null hypothesis, it means that I simply cannot use the bottles because the minimum or like the pressure that I need the bottles to withstand is 200. So if it is not able to do that, I cannot use the bottle. It will be hazardous to my clients. Okay, so this is also an engineering problem, a very interesting one. So if we go for formulation number two, whereby uh, the, the alternative hypothesis is greater than 200 PSI, if the null hypothesis is rejected, if it is rejected, the bottles will be judged satisfactory because we know that the bottles uh, will withstand a greater pressure <clears throat> and I can use the bottles. If it is not rejected, <clears throat> meaning to say that it is equal to 200 PSI, the implication is that, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> Okay, so if the null hypothesis is not rejected, the implication is that the bottles do not conform to specifications and should not be used. Okay, bear with me on this one. I know it's confusing. So if I'm not rejecting this, I'm accepting this as a possibility. They are saying that the bottles do not conform. Bear with me first. So rejecting H0 is a strong conclusion because this formulation forces the bottle manufacturer to demonstrate that the mean bursting strength of the bottles exceeds the specification. So if we accept this, we are saying that the bottles are not this. Okay. 
just bear with me first on this one, okay? If the, we are choosing this, it means it is not this. Therefore, we cannot use the bottles, even though it is equal to 200. Because it will also be uh, possible that it is less than 200. Okay, bear with me on this one. I know it's a little bit confusing. Okay, so if we were choosing formulation number two, which is mu is equal to 200 PSI and the alternative hypothesis is less than 200 PSI. So if H0 is not rejected, we're not rejecting H0, which means that we are saying yes to this, no to this, the implication is that the bottles conform to specification. Because what is the opposite of alternate hypothesis? It is greater than 200 SI. If H0 is not rejected, I am saying it is equal to 200. It is not less than 200. Therefore, it should also be greater than 200 PSI. So there's like an indirect thing that you need to think about after you have specified your uh, null and your alternative hypothesis. It's very philosophical, I think. Okay, so if the null hypothesis is rejected, meaning to say we don't want this, and we're saying that we are going for this guy, right? Yes, it's less than 200. Uh, the, balls, the, ball, the bottles will be judged unsatisfactory. Rejecting H0, um, no, this is just repeating itself. I forgot to delete this. Okay. So again, let's go back for formulation number one. So formulation number two says that if this is accepted, if this is accepted, I'm not accepting H1, it also implies that uh, the bottle can also be greater than 200 PSI. This is like indirect implication, indirect, um, indirect statement. Let's go for that. Okay, so formulation number one, let's look at this again. So if I am accepting the null hypothesis, I'm accepting this null hypothesis and I therefore I'm not accepting the H1, right? If I'm accepting this one, the bottles do not conform to the specification because Indirectly, I'm also saying that it is less than 200 PSI. Oh, how am I getting to this point? Because it is not this. If it is not this, it should be this. Okay, so if the null hypothesis is rejected, goodbye, the bottles will be judged satisfactory because we're just looking at this and this is just easy. It's greater than 200 PSI. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So when you're forming your null and also your alternative hypothesis, think about what it means when you reject or when you accept your null hypothesis. Is there any indirect uh, statements that you can make? This should be part of your discussion as well. Okay. So any questions about that one? Everyone's okay, right? Okay, so which is the best formulation? Is it formula number one or formulation number two? The answer is up to you. It is depending on your objective of the analysis. What are you looking at? Do you care about the bottles being satisfactory or do you care the bottles not being satisfactory? Do you care about your clients? Uh, do you care if the bottles explode in your client's face? Depends on what you're looking at. Okay, so for, for formulation number one, there is some probability that H0 will be re, not be rejected even though the true mean is slightly higher. Uh, for formulation number one, what was it just now? It was, sorry, mu is equal to sorry, 200 PSI or mu is greater 200. So this was our H1. Sorry about that. Very poor handwriting. Okay. So this was formulation number one. Formulation number two, let me just write that over here so we can discuss about it. Mu is less than 200. Okay. Uh, this formulation implies that we want the bottle manufacturer to demonstrate that the product meets or exceeds our specification. 
So if we reject this, the manufacturer has to give you like uh, has to confirm with you that your the bottle is indeed uh, can withstand greater pressure because you don't want it to be false right if it's false then it would explode in your client's face uh, for formulation number two if we reject the null hypothesis we would conclude that the bottles are unsatisfactory oops we would conclude that the bottles are unsatisfactory only when there is a strong evidence that the mean does not exceed 200 psi. How would this? How would we know this? Using the z-score. You have to go through the process. This is like the final process of deciding. Okay. Okay, so that was example number one. What time is it? Uh, we have 10 minutes. Let me go for another example on choosing the right null hypothesis and then we will conclude class. Okay, so last one, bear with me. Specifications for a water pipe call for a mean breaking strength mu of more than 2,000 pounds per linear foot. Just a unit, don't worry about it. Engineers will perform a hypothesis test to decide whether or not to use a certain kind of pipe. They want to decide whether they can use this pipe or not. And for them to decide, the mean breaking strength mu of more than 2,000 pounds per linear foot. It has to have this mean. This is the critical value. If we have specified the critical value, we can also specify uh, what is our null hypothesis and also our alternative hypothesis. So they will select a random sample of one feet, sorry, one foot sections of pipe measuring their breaking strength and perform a hypothesis test. So if we were uh, doing like a material engineering class, we can obviously go for this one, but we can't. So our classmates is our data. This would be more interesting, right? I'm not saying that you guys are not interesting. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm just gonna retract that statement. The pipe will not be used unless the engineers can conclude that the mu is greater than 2000. So if you, the mu is less than 2000, obviously it's not going to be uh, strong enough to withstand whatever that they are going to do, right? So the specifications must be greater than 2000. So assume that they test the null hypothesis to be mu less than or equal to 2000 versus uh, the alternative hypothesis, mu is greater than 2000. So will the engineers decide to use the pipe if we reject the null hypothesis? So if we reject the null hypothesis, what does it imply? It implies that the mean breaking strength is greater than 2000, exceeding specification. What if the null hypothesis is not rejected? First impression, if I'm not rejecting this guy, <laughs> I'm scared to do this discussion. Let's go for the answer. If the H1 is rejected, the engineers will conclude that yes, we are going for the alternative hypothesis and they will use the pipe, obviously, right? So if H0 is not rejected, the engineers will conclude that mu might be less than or equal to 2000 and they will still not use the pipe. So what is the implication here? The implication is if they use H0 less than or equal to 2000 and they choose H0, even though H0 is equal to 2000, they are still not going to use it because there is a probability that it can be below 2000. And it is very dangerous if we use something that is below specs, right? It can cause disasters. So um, the engineer's action with regard to using the pipe will differ depending on whether H0 is rejected or not. Okay. So what if we change this null and also alternative hypothesis? Just now our null, let's, let me just write it again. Uh, the mu was this guy. This was our formulation number one, for example. H1 mu is greater than 2000. So if we reject the null hypothesis, we are saying that it is exceeding specs. Very good, meaning to say uh, it is very strong. So now, what if we change the null hypothesis to be uh, greater than or equal to 2000? Is it going to be wrong? Not necessarily. Depends on your objective. And H1 is mu less than 2000. 
So how do you know that the mu is less than 2000? It has to be the opposite of null. Okay. So if the null is rejected, so let's look at this guy over here. I'm going to use a different color as to not confuse you. Excuse me. Please choose blue. Okay. Is this not blue yet? Okay, hopefully it's blue now. Blue, no. Okay, so we're talking about this uh, formulation. Formulation in blue. Oops. So what happens if we reject the null hypothesis? Is there any indirect statements involved? So if H0 is rejected, goodbye. So we are talking about this one. The engineers will conclude that the mu is uh, less than 2000. And they will not use the pipe, obviously, because it is less than specification. So if H0 is not rejected, we need to say, I am saying yes to this. The engineers will conclude that mu might be greater than or equal to 2000, but that it also might not be. So again, they won't use the pipe. Hmm. What does that mean? If H0 is not rejected, so the previous example that we talked about, formulation one, formulation two, I think it was more straightforward than this one. This one is saying if H0 is not rejected, it isn't, isn't it? Um, if we are not rejecting this, it is also saying we should accept H1. Quite confusing. So if H0 is not rejected, the engineers will conclude that mu might be greater than or equal to 2000, but that it also might not be because we're not rejecting this. So there are, how do I say this? When you are accepting or uh, rejecting something and you discuss whether or not you are going to accept the H1, you need to justify uh, because um, there's no, uh, there's, it, I think it's very subjective when we're talking about hypothesis testing. Sometimes you have, you have uh, included your statistical significance to be 5%, but you, and then you get your p-value as 4.99. The management looks at this, they said, oh, so it is statistically significant. Um, it is 5% statistically significant, but I'm still going to reject this. Sorry, I'm still going to accept this because it is close to 5%. So we can give out the values, but at the end of the day, we still have the choice of deciding whether we want to go for it or not. Okay, so... I'm going to discuss more on this tomorrow. It's a little bit subjective, I know. Um, hopefully, we can make it makes much more sense tomorrow. But uh, for today, I want you guys to revise your question if you need to. Revise your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. You can choose whether to talk about the average lifetime, the mean, uh, or you can talk about the probability, the proportion. Okay? So, uh, all the best. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye guys. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Bye bye.